I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues. Um, today's discussion is uh, for the panel to discuss technology in the developing world and how technology can make a big difference to leveling up the world. We have uh, a very interesting panel for you that I'll introduce in a moment. Um, we launched yesterday the Technology as a Force for Good report. This report does something very important for this particular discussion we're about to have. It shows that 50% of the UN Sustainable Development Goals can be achieved through technology. It places technology and the leaders of technology in the forefront of leveling up the world. That's a huge step in the right direction. There has been so much doom and gloom around whether we will level up the world, whether the poorer countries, particularly in the global south, and individuals left out all across the world within rich countries will get to participate in the future in, in peace, prosperity, and the freedom that comes with it. And our report shines some light on that. It looks at the top 100 technology companies. Almost all of them are here. They're in CES, and they're showing their, their technologies to us. And this report draws that out and highlights that their technologies, existing technologies, can help close this gap. So it, it is very much a positive statement about what is possible at this stage in our history. It looks ahead too and identifies 19 core technologies that exist today that will shape the future. This panel today is, is very distinguished and very interesting to actually shed light on this. I'm delighted CES were able to host this, and particularly on the Great Minds series. Um, let me kick off and uh, make a brief introduction of each of, my, each of my fellow panelists. So we have Stedman Graham on the end. Stedman is uh, an author, an educator, a speaker, an influencer, who has an impact on many, many lives by teaching them how they can participate in today's society across all walks of life. Identity leadership is also something that he talks a lot about. Um, he's published 12 books, two of them on the New York Times bestseller list. Thank you very much for being here, Stedman. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Trammell Crow. Trammell Clo Crow is, um, is a very interesting panelist for us. He's a Texan multi-billionaire environmentalist. Trammell, I don't know how many of those there might be. It's probably one. <laughs> he's also the founder of something called EarthX which is the largest gathering of people um, from every walk of life to get together and discuss and learn and educate themselves and each other about the environment. 180,000 people attended at the peak. Um, within that, there is a, a series of conferences and uh, there are 450 speakers who turn up every year to talk about the world from all walks of life, NGOs, politics, United Nations, and so on. And then we have Walt Stinson, Walt um, is an entrepreneur, a businessman. He's chairman of ProSource. Um, he also uh, created a company called Listen Up, um, which is amongst the top 10 distributors of consumer electronics. And he's also famous for being in 2009 in the class next to Steve Jobs that were introduced into the Hall of Fame. So uh, I'm delighted to welcome this group. Thank you very much, all of you, for attending. Let oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me kick off with a question for you, Stedman. Um, you see lots of people from many, many walks of life. Um, and you know the challenges of the developing world very well. What do you see as the biggest challenges face, facing them today? Well, I, I think, uh, I mean, I spent all of my life um, really trying to figure out what equality looks like in my own life. And what I realized is that unless you know who you are, uh, you can't possibly uh, reach your potential as a human being. And so when I discovered that the missing piece was understanding who you are and not having an identity, I was searching for mine. And I realized that probably out of the world that we live in, you probably have about 8 billion people in the world who really don't know who they are. Pretty much lost. And uh, it kind of goes like this. They wake up in the morning, they wash their face, they brush their teeth, they get something to eat, they get the kids off to school, work all day, come home in the afternoon, they spend time with the family, they watch TV, they go to bed, maybe they dream that's Monday. 
And then on Tuesday, they repeat the same thing. They get up in the morning and wash your face, you brush your teeth, you get something to eat, get the kids off school, work all day, come home in the afternoon, spend time with the family, watch TV, they go to bed, maybe they dream that's Tuesday. And they repeat that same cycle over and over again. So if you did the same thing you did yesterday, as you would do today, as you would do tomorrow, what have you done, the answer probably would be nothing. You're not thinking, you're not designing, you're not creating, certainly not developing your potential as a human being. And so the school teaches you how to memorize and take tests, repeat the information back, you get labeled with a grade, two weeks later we forget the information. So if you're doing the same thing over and over, which is nothing, everything you learn you forget, which is nothing, nothing from nothing is nothing. And so I don't know how you make it today unless you know your talents, your skills, your abilities, what you love, what makes you happy, and what makes your life meaningful. Uh, I don't know how you source content, or I don't know how you organize information around that. So when we talk about human security, I, don't, I, I see it very, very difficult having human security when you don't even own yourself. And then you're labeled by the outside world as a way to get them to marginalize your existence so you don't have a process for growing, developing, building, and creating social economic development. So I think one of the biggest challenges today is to really focus on what you do well, what you can become an expert in, and then being able to source the content and technology, which you couldn't have a better opportunity than today to be able to to live in, in, in the history of the world because we have access to technology. And if we can apply that technology to our own development uh, and segment that in every area of our life so that we can focus on maximizing social economic development and reaching our potential, man, you really have something special. And so it's what I've, what I've learned in my own life is that the technology is a tool. And if you can apply the, the technology tools to your own personal professional development, man, you can really create uh, so much opportunity for yourself as a human being. Thank you, thank you. Well, um, we start with the deep point about understanding ourselves. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask Tramway you to pick that up, please. Um, you see over 100,000 people walk through the halls of EarthX. What, what do you see as the issues and challenges of the developing world in particular but the sort of people who are curious about what it takes to build a better world? Well, first of all, it's awareness. And the awareness level in Texas can be very lacking. Okay. You know, uh, so it, it is education. And that, that uh, works with the way we do it, with Expo and with conference. Uh, technology pervade today pervades all solutions. But traditionally, let's say the original environmentalism is conservationism. Maybe you could say starting with Teddy Roosevelt and the National Forest System, and which what we can get by with saying in Dallas, wildlife conservation through hunting and fishing. <laughs> and, but there wasn't, there wasn't much technology involved. Environmentalism started off more about protest and, and litigation and so forth. Today they've come together, and I like to think that we bring them together, but in the expo and in conference, technology plays a major part. Thank you, thank you, Trump. Walt, tell us, I mean, let, re reflect a little bit on the same question. Yeah. Um, it seems as if two thirds of the world, the developing world, um, did not get to participate in the technologies that drive everything today. Right. They don't have the industrial jobs, they don't have the education, right. you know, they don't have the access to food and water in the same way that the rest of us do. What do you see as the challenge and potentially the uh, Well, we, the, the session heading is Tech Needs of the Developing World, and uh, I'm a director of the Human Security for All campaign. I've been working on that campaign um, for two years straight. Um, I've seen a lot in the in the uh, in the the evolution of CES and in the tech industry. I've seen it move from analog to digital. Now it's moving uh, at warp speed to uh, an AI-powered digital future. Um, I think the primary technique of the developing world is to get the developed world to understand that the developing world is a different world. 
Um, especially in the United States, I find that we're very insulated and arrogant um, about our economy and about our system, and um, and we we tend to um, ignore the developing world's needs. Um, I like to remind myself that the United States represents only 3% of the population of the world. Um, when you think about it that way, uh, you realize that we really are not, while we may be a dominant force in technology, for example, and we are, we're not dominating the world in terms of the world's population. And there's, um, there's a developing world, primarily in the South, that isn't benefiting from technology the way I have and the way all of you have. And uh, I see that in the education needs of the developing world, in the, the agricultural needs of the developing world, in the water needs of the developing world, and in the healthcare needs of the developing world. These are all areas that can greatly benefit from technological innovation and some of the things that we take for granted that are actually pretty cheap and easy to implement um, are not being implemented in the developing world. So one of the greatest techniques of the developing world is for us to put more energy into it, pay more attention to it, and try to help it along a little bit more than we have so far, I think. Uh, and Walt, that, that price point is falling. And as it falls further and further, the people in the developing world who were not customers have a chance to become customers. And you've experienced this. If you look back in your career at um, how expensive technology was, whether it was uh, a, a mobile phone, a radio, yeah. anything, it's just fallen so far. Well, All of one, this can access One of the it. things that I, 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 I have a chance to talk to a lot of CEOs of manufacturing companies, and one of the things I tell them is pay attention to the developing world. That's your, your future customer. Maybe not next year, but when you look at it in... Uh, you know, there's a, there's a saying in our industry that we tend to overestimate what's going to happen next year and underestimate what's going to happen in 10 years. And that's certainly been true in my career, and I think for most of us out there, we recognize that that's true. Um, one of the things that we need to understand is that the developing world really has a lot of needs, is a, 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 a ripe market, can be developed, for the manufacturers here at CES and should be um, getting more attention. Um, there should be products that are designed specifically for the developing world. And that, that takes a little bit of effort because uh, it's not a, it may have the people, but it doesn't have the, the, the dollar market share. Yeah. But uh, it, it, to go in there and create a brand in a country like Indonesia, for example, which is going to be a big one, or India, for example, which is going to be a big one, I think makes perfect sense. Um, so we can push these technologies out there and it doesn't have to be in an altruistic way. I, I think it just requires visionary leadership. That brings me straight to Sedman. Visionary leadership, what is it gonna to take to make this happen? To, to really apply these technologies, level up the world, give it to people who today seemingly can't afford it? Well, I think it's a leadership issue for sure. I mean, you have a big gap between the 1% and the 99%. And uh, it's, I think it's an educational issue also because uh, I know in this country, United States, um, you know, you have very, various degrees of educational institutions that provide different levels of education. And so the thing I like about technology today is that you have the information and you have access to the information, and you can make that information applicable to your development in addition to the basic education that you, that you get in schools. So you have some autonomy, you have some independence, you have the ability to be global. Uh, again, what I learned and what's helped me so much is being able to apply the information to my talents, to my skills, to my, to my ability, and particularly to what I love in life, what my passions are, what my purpose is. And so that changed the whole game for me. And so if you could teach people how to utilize the technological um, opportunities and tools that we have and make it relevant to their development, 
so it becomes a part of their lifestyle and their life, they have a much better chance of, of getting all the information they need to increase their, um, their, their opportunities. Um, now, Tram, I'll, I'll ask you to comment a little bit on that. In terms of the solutions you've seen, what have you seen people do that really changes something in, in FX? Following up with what you say, market forces will take care of so much. The sheer need for housing, uh, mass uh, low-cost housing can be quite energy efficient and green. So uh, we're a pro-business outfit, which is rather rare in the environmental world, uh, with, with many corporate uh, in, uh, people involved. So that's a good example, but agriculture and third world countries, there's just sheer demand is bringing in drones, and it's not as high tech as big ag in America, but it's starting to, to, to get there. And I think we found that also in our report that actually the drive to monetize the core technologies, these 19 I mentioned that we identified, will, will drive people to new markets, to find new customers, to keep selling them these new products. And essentially that, will, that should lift the world. But it does require policy. Um, it, it does require people to, to respect different cultures and understand them, how to apply their technology in those cultures. Um, so, so the journey is ahead in some ways to unlock the next six billion of the world that haven't really got it. Uh, uh, Walton, human security for all is part of that, right? That's yeah, an opportunity. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the market, uh, that's for sure. Um, microeconomics is my favorite subject. Um, and I, I believe in the invisible hand um, and, and the good that it can do. But uh, the, so much of the developing world um, lacks infrastructure, act, as I was mentioning earlier, that they lack access to things that we take for granted. They lack electricity. They lack an internet connectivity option. Um, they lack um, all sorts of Im infrastructure. And I think m most importantly, uh, they lack a lot of uh, human security elements. Uh, the human security campaign is a cam campaign about, about trying to bring to the public's attention the importance of individual security and what the elements of in individual security are. And political security is one of them. So without political security, it's unlikely that you're going to have a responsive government that's going to address these infrastructure needs. So um, I, I think that we've got some big, uh, big problems <laughs> that, that defy uh, easy solutions, but I, I do think that that what tech can do is drive the cost down. Um, the, uh, water systems can be developed, um, clean water systems can be developed less expensively. Clean energy solutions can be applied on the village level. Uh, a, a technology like Starlink can uh, provide internet access without any expensive infrastructure. So I think we're at the cusp of perhaps a breakthrough in, in uh, tech for the developing world that can turbocharge the developing world and provide, um, um, uh, uh, you know, equalize things a bit, at least providing uh, equal opportunities. You know, that's what I like to preach is give people equal opportunities and they'll rise to the occasion. But if they don't have those opportunities, it's very difficult for them to, to, uh, to, to, to meet uh, any kind of expectation that we might have for ourselves in this country. Uh, and Walter, the Human Security for All campaign is designed to do that, to, to spread that message out. And CES this year, um, and it's the second time they did this last year too, they embraced HS4A, the Human Security for All campaign, um, as a way to give, almost add purpose to everything that's technology. Um, why did that happen? Why is it so important? And how is it helping the message get out? CES's board um, recognizes the role that tech plays in creating um, a better future. Um, uh, also, I want to circle back and talk about uh, Catan's group, Force for Good, that, that published the report yesterday. It's at forcegood.org. It was presented at a session yesterday. I encourage everybody to, to go to the link, forcegood.org, and take a look at this tech report 
which was presented to the industry by his organization and uh, is a 132-page report that has a lot of data in it that can help strategic planners better understand some of the issues that we're talking about on stage today. But circling back to CTA and, and, and what C CTA is the, uh, the, the owner of CES, and, and CTA recognizes that tech has a role to play in, um, in the advancement of humanity in the developed world and in the developing world, and that technology can help close the gap, um, a, a couple of different gaps. First of all, the United Nations, who's a partner in human security for all that, that I'm involved in, the United Nations created the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. 193 countries signed on to these goals. Uh, we're falling short. Uh, traditionally, we just look for more money, more taxes, and so forth to close that gap. But uh, I think what we've realized is, and CTA certainly realizes, is that tech can close that gap, yeah. perhaps better than money can and faster than money can, because tech is developing exponentially, and the tools that we have available to close the development gap are developing exponentially, AI being a really great example of that. I'm going you know, like to word human, I like the word human security, uh, because I think uh, if the pandemic taught us anything, it taught us that you know, when you're in that house by yourself, you were by yourself. And the only person you can really rely on is yourself. And so you need the tools to be able to manage yourself, uh, to manage your historical background, to manage your emotions, to manage your current situations. Uh, strong social emotional development is very important. Uh, we learned that. Um, <clears throat> having access to technology, you know, everybody got on Zoom at the same time, mm -hmm. which put everybody into a technological mindset was very valuable. Uh, you don't have to travel, it saves you a lot of money. Uh, so I, I just think that when you talk about human security, uh, wow, that encompasses so many things, climate change, the ability to be able to, uh, uh, you know, protect your community, you know, uh, find resources for yourself and your family, all those things that you have access through this, these te technological tools, which is unbelievable today. And uh, so it, it, it's just, I, I'm not a techie. Um, I'm becoming more of a techie now because I realize the value of it. But man, I just, I'm so excited to be here and have the opportunity to learn so much about how you can use technology as a way to empower your own existence and define your own being. So continue with that theme for me because um, we spoke earlier about how democracy, the markets, um, trade, all these things shaped the 20th century and have continued the 21st century. But the rise of social media empowering the individual has been an enormous force which can be disruptive but can be positive too. How do you see, do you see this being a top-down effort going forward? What do you see as the role of the individual in this change uh, that, that we're about to embark on now with technology empowering? Well, the role of the in individual is to be conscious of what's available to them you know, as a way to um, uh, make their life better. So, I mean, I have an eight-year-old granddaughter, and she got introduced to technology, and she, she, she's really a smart, per, a smart girl, and she, she said, you know, to her mom, my daughter, she said, you know, technology should, should make us better people. And she got that at eight years wow. of age. Yeah. So if the world gets that, that we can understand that technology should make us better people yeah. and, and create opportunities for people because poverty is, is created politically. Yeah. You know, it's created. If people don't want to be poor. They're poor because it's a structural issue. There's enough to go around. Probably. There's enough to go around, especially in America, greatest country, one of the greatest countries in the world. So to be able to understand how to utilize the opportunities and, and, and all of the resources that we have now globally, which is access through technology, that's a gift. 
if you understand how to apply that to your own personal professional development, where you become the role model for yourself, your family, and then your community, and hopefully your country. A force for good. Yeah, a force for good. So I just think having an awareness around that allows other people to be educated in a different way. Yeah. You got to have math, you got to have science, you need geography, you need all those basic fundamental skills. But certainly now, this tool, this iPhone, this, uh, you know, this device, my goodness gracious, you can ask it any question, you can do research on it, you can, you know, it, it, you, can, you can travel with it, it's got GPS, it's got everything that you need in order to be able to empower yourself. So the, the, the question is, is that how do we make that available to people at all levels? Thank you, and Trammell, I'm gonna ask you to pick that up because now take it to the island states for us where, where you touched on earlier. Um, it's an important part of the conference. You work with the United Nations on it. What does we it feel saying, like to be one of those? Before we walked in, we were saying the island nations, members of the United Nations, comprise a 20% voting block, which is far beyond their, their populations. Uh, imagine being on an island out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and you don't really see anything but a horizon line, and you know sea level rising, sea level is rising slowly but surely. There have to be technological solutions. What mainly is addressed at the uh, Island Resilience Forum with us every year, uh, a couple of heads of state typically, this year it'll be three or four, uh, Prime Minister of St. Martin's, Antigua and Barbuda, I believe Tonga. What that has occurred at these conferences is public-private uh, partnerships have been formed with innovation companies attending, uh, addressing the grid and power generation. Up until now, it's just been how many uh, gallons of diesel fuel can you bring to the island every day, which is so bad in so many ways. Maybe it was the sea level rise that made them start thinking, maybe diesel fuel's not the best way. So a few of these island nations have begun uh, new power grids. But I'd like to point out the classical view between what I've heard called the environmentalist, the environmental apocalyptist, who's so worried about the end of the world and says, no. you've got to stop consuming and you have to start recycling every little thing, versus the innovative wizard technology. It wasn't that long ago that it was only uh, scrimp and save and, and the doom and gloom and the environmental uh, approach. The, the technology is in the fr uh, front seat now, but it is a combination of both. And we do have to uh, make sacrifices still and not be mesmerize that technology is going to be the total solution. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to ask a question which might be on the mind of some people here, which is your, business, your family created a huge amount of wealth from real estate. You're Without a businessman. a single man, green building. <laughs> you're a businessman who um, has been very, very successful doing what you did. For the last nearly 15 years, you've dedicated your time, and I, I know you work something like 15, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, on the environment. Why are you doing that? Because I think that we're uh, in a very dire situation across the board uh, around the globe. And it's not just climate change. Uh, it, nobody knows how soon the food chain in the ocean will be collapsed. 90% uh, of all large marine life is already gone. That's profound. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to ask you. I'm a No, it's important. It's important to get that context as to why you're driven at this stage in life to give up your sleep to do this. Uh, I want to ask the audience a quick question. Uh, how many of you, in one click, get to chat GPT on your phone? It's about 60%, two thirds maybe. I asked this question in the Middle East only um, eight weeks ago in, a, in an audience uh, maybe twice the size. Um, five people put their hands up. 
it, it, was, it was interesting because uh, there is a view that unless you are using this technology, you will underperform and the technology will outperform you. Now, there are lots of reasons. From a neuroscience perspective, you might say it isn't still conscious. This technology, AI, is not still smart enough and we're smarter. But is it, is it smarter than the average? Is it smarter than the top 20%? is smarter than the top 10%. It's inexorably getting smarter than each of us, but certainly has already outperformed the average on numerous tests. Um, you saw the second video, and the president of the World Academy of Art and Science, Gary Jacobs, was the voiceover. And he was pointing out to me yesterday how technology might solve the problems, but unless we build values, such as human security for all, into the technology, it will be another machine to, to do things that could be bad. And the World Academy was, was founded by Oppenheimer. Um, and w we, we all know that that was a piece of technology that was ever so destructive in terms of making its impact. Um, you've spoken about AI. What makes you think that the AI will help us liberate the developing world and all of us and raise us to the next level as opposed to being a destructive force? What does it take to do that? And are we capable of actually doing the things? Are we capable? That's yet to be, I think we're capable, absolutely, yeah. Um, AI is turbocharging our industry right now. It's infusing virtually every, every product. All of the companies that I talk to or have plans to infuse AI into their products in some way or another, just about everybody that's here. Um, the automotive companies are leading in that area. Um, AI, I think, is going to turbocharge the world's, the global economy. I think it's going to result in um, a, a, a blossoming of standards of living and productivity and wealth that we can only imagine. Um, that that um, That is going to open up a vista of possibilities for humanity that offer a lot, a full spectrum of, of positive, both positive and negative aspects to us. I think that human security for all is a paradigm um, that we need to utilize in order to guide us in the development of AI and the deployment of AI. AI has some very profound moral implications, ethical and moral implications that really need to be answered as it's deployed and it requires global cooperation to do that. Um, right now the US is competing with China, Europe is in the mix, um, uh, and India is uh, certainly going to be in the mix as well. Um, and, and as we compete, we have different visions about what AI is going to do for our future. Is it going to be our slave? Is it going to be our peer? Or is it going to be our master? If you study the science fiction out there, you'll see that all three of those scenarios are presented as quite plausible um, and, and, and I think they are quite plausible, all three of them. So human security for all, uh, the campaign that we're involved in, is a way of promoting a concept, uh, a method of looking at the problems uh, that AI is pre presenting to us and uh, bringing everybody together to the, address those problems effectively before they, they turn into <coughs> existential threats. Thank you, Walt. We're well, in the last, say, we're in the last few say, minutes, and I was going to ask you, Stephen. Don't get so involved with technology that you become a slave to it. You know, that you lose the human touch. You don't know how to build relationships. You don't know how to communicate with other people. It's already happening without AI, uh, isn't it? <laughs> I get it. I get it. Uh, but it needs to be also set again. You know, so it's a tool. And uh, the most important thing that you have is your energy because I can feel your energy. You know, I can kind of read you a little bit. 
And so the ability to be able to, and in business, as we know, business, as you would know, this for sure, business is about relationships. Yeah. Just because you build something doesn't mean somebody's going to buy it. It's because people give you business because they like you and they care about you. And there's group economics. So, you know, let's not think that technology solves all of our problems, but, but be able to enhance your value based on what it does and make it relevant to your development when, when that becomes relevant. Thank you. May I ask an environmental Please. question about AI? Yeah. What I, what I hear is the power demand, the increased electricity consumption because of AI will be astronomical. So how will we deal with it? Let me, let me address that because oh. I was... Uh, yeah. I was speaking to a man who was very uh, head of, uh, of um, the technology uh, aspect of the CIA yesterday. And his assessment was that uh, nuclear fusion has moved from a theoretical physics um, perspective to an engineering problem. Hmm. So he feels that cheap, abundant, Clean energy is something that we can definitely see on the horizon. That's going to uh, transform the developing world as well. And, um, and, and I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to make sure that, that you uh, spoke a little bit about FinTech, because I know that's something you've been very involved in. Oh, sure. I mean, like, um, uh, we, we, we did a study of uh, finance and technology intersection, how it might include people from all around the world. And we, we looked at technologies all over the planet. And we found that um, the private sector had huge amounts of fintech to offer. But the most uh, astonishing experiment in fintech was, uh, was in India, where the government had created a piece of fintech where you register your ID and it automatically opens a bank account for you. With the bank account, they gave you an insurance policy for accident cover, um, critical health care, and also added to it a few more things, like uh, a soft loan. And half a billion people of all levels of literacy and poverty were able to open a bank account in the last eight years. So technology was this liberator <coughs> for all these people, for half a billion people in the space of eight years. We realized the same will happen in tech, in education and tech, uh, in healthcare and tech. And as you walk through CES, I hope you will look out for these technologies because they're here. It's just the imagination to roll it out in the scale at which it will make that impact. And um, on that note, I see they're telling us we've actually finished. Um, but I'm going to ask each of you to say just a few words, and then we'll close. Stedman, please. Uh, I'm just excited to be here. Uh, and I see the opportunity as a way to utilize it to seg segment my whole life based on all the things that I love and care about. And, and now have access to a global marketplace. And so to be able to make all of those things relevant to my empowerment and to be able to teach that and to train people how to do that, it's very exciting. Thank so you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Travel. Thank you for the opportunity to put in a commercial plug. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, tech needs of the developing world, I think number one on my list would be education. And I think that technology has the ability to transform education, to deliver education in new and different ways, and to disrupt the existing educational system, which tends to be exclusionary and focused more on uh, what's taught than what the outcomes are of what's taught. And so I, I, I hope that as we move forward in uh, technological deployment, that, that we see educational systems being delivered more effectively into the developing world. Thank you. Thank you for, for all of you for your thoughts and for sharing so openly. Thank you for CES and the Human Security for All team that is also in the audience here today. Thank you, all of you. <laughs>